Hello, welcome to today's photosynthesis webinar. I'm Louise Diva, and our webinars are sponsored by the Capitalize project. And today, I'm delighted to welcome my two presenters, Sebastio Capabalca and Brené Klein Langhorst. Uh, we'll start off with Sebastia. Uh, Sebastia is based in the University of the Balearic Islands, uh, did a Master's in Applied Biotechnology and a PhD on Rubisco evolution in marine macrophytes. His research explores potential kinetic malleability of Rubisco with the aim of designing or bring improved Rubiscos with um, better with desired kinetic properties that can be used in crops for improvement. Today, he's going to talk to us about his work on rubisco kinetics in the seagrass Posidonia. Is that right, Posidonia? Yes, <laughs> you that right. Thank you. Well, can you confirm that you that you can see my screen? Yes, I can see. It looks great. Good. Uh, well, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks to the organization for allowing me to present our work in this webinar, which is entitled Rubisco Kinetics in Posidonia Seagrass Species, a different evolutionary pathway from Angiosperm Rubisco. This work is a result of a collaboration uh, between the plant physiology groups at the University of Balearic Islands and Australian National University. Angiosperms are at the top of the, ter of the terrestrialization process and present uh, some of the most complex adaptations to live in terrestrial environments. However, little attention uh, has been given to angiosperm seawater colonization, a remarkable event in which most of the terrestrial adaptations achieved during angiosperm evolution were reversed. The remarkable achievement was only attained by a limited number of species, called seagrasses. Seagrasses present contrasting characteristics relative to their ter terrestrial counterparts, such as surface of underwater pollination and the loss of stomata. But the most important characteristics in the present study are the photosynthetic adaptations to survive under seawater. Carbon assimilation under seawater is limited by a low CO2 availability. Because of a slow gas diffusion in seawater, which is 10,000 times slower than in the air, and the slow interconversion among dissolved inorganic carbon forms. All of this exacerbate rubisco catalytic inefficiencies, namely its incapability to discriminate between CO2 and oxygen, its poor affinity for CO2, and its low carboxylation rate. Therefore, it is not surprising that most marine photosynthetic organisms develop CO2 concentration mechanisms to concentrate CO2 near, the rubi near their rubisco active sites. For all of these reasons, and considering that CO2 has been proved to be one of the major drivers for rubisco evolution, seagrasses offers a unique opportunity for the investigation of angiosperm rubisco adaptations in marine environments. Among seagrasses, the genus Posidonia is an iconic group and includes species with high ecological interest and high carbon sequestration capacity. But the more relevant trait in the present context is the disjunct distribution of Posidonia species across the globe, with four species, Posidonia australis, Sinuosa, Angustifolia, and Coriacea, along Australian coastlines, and, the, and, the, and only a single endemic species, Posidonia oceanica, in the Mediterranean Sea. Such disjunct distribution could lead to different patterns of rubisco evolution and could inform about relevant mutations in, rubisco, in the rubisco structure. In this sense, the main objective of this study is to reveal how the rubisco kinetic properties of Posidonian species have been impacted by their disjunct geographic distribution and diverge phylogeny, along with their CCM effectiveness. The hypothesis supporting this objective is that rubisco kinetics differs among Posidonian species according to the CCM effectiveness and their phylogenetic relationship. To respond to this objective, we measured the, the activity of CCMs of Posidonia species. Their CCMs do not involve the C-form metabolism as found in land plants. Instead, they present biophysical CCMs. 
the identification and characterization of these biophysical CCMs is challenging, and up to date, there are no direct approaches for measuring CO2 concentration near Rubisco during steady state photosynthesis. Therefore, the characterization of CCNs in Posidonia species requires the use of indirect approaches, such as the photosynthetic response to different CCM inhibitors like trees pH buffer. This buffer inhibits proton extrusion pumps, which coupled with external carbonic anhydrases can create, an, can create an acidic zone in the periplasmatic space that displaces the equilibrium of DIC towards CO2. Then, this high CO2 concentration generated in the periplasmatic space can diffuse through cellular membranes, increasing CO2 concentration near Rubisco and constitu constituting one of the most uh, relevant uh, CCMs reported in seagrasses. Another indirect approach um, to assess the activity in the seagrasses species are the photosynthetic in vivo response to different big concentrations, which were measured using oxygen electrodes, as you can see in this image. <clears throat> Furthermore, Rubisco kinetics were measured in vitro at 25 degrees in leaf strats of all Posidonia species using radioisotope techniques. With this approach, we measured all the Rubisco catalytic parameters in the Posidonia species, namely the KCAT C and KCAT O, the reaction turnover rates for carboxylation and oxygenation, respectively, that defines the maximum velocity of reaction, KC and KO, the Michaelis maintain constant for CO2 and oxygen, respectively and defines the uh, affinity of the enzyme for the substrates. And remember, the higher the Michaelis maintain constant, the lower the affinity for the substrates. And finally, the specificity factor, which, which defines the number of carboxylations relative to oxygenations or Rubisco at the specific CO2 and oxygen concentrations. The results demonstrated that Rubisco kinetics of Posidonian species showed unique patterns within angiosperms. In these graphs, we can observe in squares those values compiled for terrestrial angiosperms, and in triangles, those values measured in the present study for the five Posidonia species. In particular, Posidonia species were located above other terrestrial angiosperms in the correlation between KO and KC, implying a lower oxygen affinity for a given KC and therefore a partial decoupling between these two Michaelis maintain constants. In a similar way, Posidonia species were located below other terrestrial angiosperms in the correlation between KCAT-C and KC, indicating a lower Rubisco carboxylation efficiency in Posidonia species. The case of Posidonia oceanica was remarkable, with the highest KC and KO values, and thus the lowest Rubisco carboxylation efficiencies among seagrasses, among Posidonia, sorry, and overall um, angiosperms species. Therefore, the results indicate that the catalytic evolution of Rubisco in Posidonia species differs from terrestrial plants. After sequencing the, the, the complete uh, large subunit from the five Posidonia species, we observed that the singular Rubisco kinetic traits of Posidonia oceanica were related to five unique amino acid substitutions relative to the conserved sequence among the Australian Posidonia species. Attending the three-dimensional structure of Rubisco, these five unique amino acid substitutions may have an impact on the interaction between Rubisco subunits and on the stability of the Arctic site, explaining the low CO2 and oxygen Rubisco affinity in Posidonia oceanica. This species is an outlier among seagrasses, is comparatively longer lived, highly productive, and capable of storing the largest sediment carbon stocks among seagrasses. Therefore, we hypothesize that the CCM effectiveness in Posidonia oceanica could be higher than in the other Australian Posidonias. In this sense, we assessed the effectiveness of CCMs in all Posidonia species by comparing in vitro and in vivo measurements of CO2 assimilation. From the in vivo CO2 assimilation measurements at varying external CO2 concentrations, we obtained the corresponding Michaelis maintain constant Km in vivo. 
from the in vitro CO2 carboxylation measurements at varying CO2 concentrations, we obtained uh, the, the Rubisco Michael is maintained constant for CO2 under air conditions, KCR. When the in vivo CO2 simulation is, a, is below the in vitro one, indicates that carbon acquisition is limited by diffusive barriers. And when in vivo CO2 simulation is above in vitro one, indicates the presence of CCMs. Therefore, the ratio KCR in vitro, KM in vivo, could be used as a proxy of the time that CO2 is concentrated or reduced near Rubisco apted sites. And according to previous studies, this ratio needs to be higher than 2.5 to corroborate an effective CCM in seagrasses. In these plots, red dotted lines um, represent the in vitro rubisco carboxylation, and solid blue lines represent the in vivo CO2 assimilation in all Posidonia species. At set in Posidonia angustifolia, the in vivo CO2 assimilation was above in vitro one in all Posidonia species, and especially in Posidonia oceanica, which presented the highest KCR in vitro KM in vivo uh, ratio indicating that Posidonia oceanica has the highest capacity to concentrate CO2 near the Rubisco apted sites. The in vivo CO2 assimilation was also determined under the presence of this pH buffer, green lines, which inhibits CCMs based on, prot on proton extrusion pumps coupled with external carbonic anhydrases. This pH buffer inhibits in vivo CO2 simulation in all Posidonia species, except in the case of Posidonia angustifolia, indicating a low CCM activity in this species and explaining why in angustifolia the in vitro rubisco carboxylation was above uh, in vivo one. The weak CCM in Posidonia angustifolia correlated with, with higher rubisco and chlorophyll concentrations as compared to other Posidonia species. The results may indicate an adaptation to the low light availability found in deep habitats where Posidonia angustifolia lives, around 20 meters depth relative to other Posidonia species that were sampled in, in a much shallower area from 3 to 5 meter depth. And then these results demonstrate that CCMs are regulated by environmental factors in Posidonia species, especially by those limiting the energy availability to fuel CCMs. All the results raises a question to respond in future investigations. Why has Posidonia rubisco evolved differently relative to the rest of the ferns and towards a low rubisco carboxylation efficiency? Some of our preliminary results demonstrated a remarkable TSE wall in Posidonia species, especially the sternal one, which together with the slow oxygen diffusion under seawater can increase intercellular oxygen concentrations up to 35%. Attending that the rubisco carboxylation, attending the tight relationship between rubisco carboxylation and oxygenation efficiency, which was corroborated across many photosynthetic organisms, the decrease in rubisco carboxylation found in Posidonia species correlated with a proportional decrease in rubisco oxygenation efficiency. In this sense, a low oxygenation efficiency of rubisco in Posidonia species could be beneficial, beneficial and allow them to maintain low photorespiration rates in order to not compromise their carbon balance. Therefore, a low rubisco oxygenation efficiency was probably selected in Posidonia species even under high CO2 concentration provided by CCMs, provoking an avoidable reduction in rubisco carboxylation efficiency. To sum up, the take-home message of this study is that the catalytic evolution of Posidonia rubisco has been impacted by the low CO2 availability of marine environments, leading Posidonia rubisco to follow an alternative evolutive pathway to that characteristic of terrestrial angiosperm rubisco, but also with contrasting rubisco kinetics among Posidonia species according to their time of diversification. If you need more information uh, about this study, you can check our publication in plant physiology that is shown in this slide. Finally, I want to thank all the people that make this work possible, the founding, and to all of you for your attention. Thank you.
very much. Thank you, Sebastian. That was very nice. Um, if anyone has any questions you'd like me to put to Sebastian, please uh, type them in the box or raise your hand. Let me just check and I will put them to him. Um, you looked at, at marine species of, or, or marine forms of rubisco and would you expect um, freshwater species to have similar characteristics? Or similar kinetics because they're, they're problems in terms of CO2 diffusion and depth. Would that be reasonable to expect the similar sort of um, amino acid substitutions, or do you think it's a whole new ballgame? Uh, well, do you refer what we spent before the we uh, we performed the study in in, in marine uh, species? Do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So if you look. Um, would you expect to see similar changes? Um, well, it's possible because I found, for example, in C4 plants, uh, the, the seagrasses also present CCM, CCMs to concentrate CO2 near the ruby squat pit size. But um, the, evolu the coevolution of rubisco in seagrasses and, and the coevolution of CCMs with C4 metabolism is completely different. What we observe in C4 plants is that the rubisco increases the maximum carboxylation ve velocity at the expense of rubisco affinity for CO2. In contrary, in seagrasses, there, there was not uh, an increase in rubisco carbo uh, carboxylation velocity, but there was a decrease in rubisco uh, affinity for CO2. So this was surprising for us, and one of the possible explanations is what I explained in the in the last slide that could be related with the expected height high oxygen con concentration in the intercellular environment of Posidonia species. This is why I think the, the coevolution of CCNs with Rubisco in, in marine uh, plants is different from what we expect or what we observe in terrestrial uh, organisms on uh, terrestrial plants. Okay. And regarding, I don't know if you you ask me some what, something about the the mutations of the of Rubisco. Yeah. So I, I just wondered whether anyone had looked to see if there were similar differences uh, or, or similar amino acid substitutions in freshwater Rubisco Rubiscos. Mm, in our there is another publication in our group. That we don't see uh, an, any specific mutations um, related with the um, with the, um, the kinetic of seagrasses. So it seemed that there was a, a, com, a, a, a an, evol, a, a, an evolutive convergence of different rubisco morphotypes to a similar kinetics in seagrasses. It seems it not it cannot be related with the specific amino acids in the rubisco large subunit. Um, the, I have a question. Oh, sorry. The, the, we cannot read really it uh, in in seagrasses, but in the in the in this case, the five um, unique amino acid substitutions that we what, that we find in Posidonia oceanica probably explain its uh, its low CO2 and, and oxygen uh, rubisco affinity relative to other Australian Posidonias. But the overall um, rubisco kinetics of seagrasses, which is different from terrestrial C4 plants cannot be explained only by these five unique amino acids. I don't know if this was more the a little bit more declaration of that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Zina Johnson. Why would Posidonia specifically want to avoid photorespiration? Well, um... What do you mean? Why they evolved in order to reduce their photorespiration? In principle, this is a in a, in a hypothesis that we have is that the oxygen concentration inside the cells of Posidonia species during a steady state photosynthesis uh, are very high, so it can compromise um, the, rubisco, the the carbon balance of the species 
because of, of a lot of photorespiration rates. So if you reduce it, the Rubisco oxygenation efficiency, as uh, we, uh, we can see, uh, uh, we see, uh, we, as we observed in Posidonian species, then the photorespiration, uh, then this problem will be uh, overcome. I don't know if I respond to your question, but in principle is because in under seawater, um, the photorespiration could be a, a, a problem if you don't have um, carbon concentration mechanisms or reduced Rubisco oxygenation efficiency. I've got a question here from uh, Moges uh, Retta. Are the carbonic anhydrases in these species different in kinetic properties from terrestrial plants? Wow, <laughs> interesting question. Uh, um, in principle, they are very similar to the to angiosperm carbonic anhydrases, but we don't analyze it uh, in, in our study. So we we analyze the activity of carbonic anhydrases because um, they coupled with proton extrusion pumps uh, of the Posidonia species can increase can can be an indicator an indicative of the presence of CCM. But we don't measure the the, the kinetics of the carbonic anion races in these species, so we don't know uh, which are there, which are them. <clears throat> um, is there any more questions for Sebastian? Ah, yes, I have one here from uh, Jason. I'm terrible at saying these names. <laughs> Laurentos. Uh, can this knowledge be useful for breeding programs aimed at plant improvement? Uh, I, I, I suppose that the, that um, it means that the, if the Rubisco kinetic that we found uh, in this study could be increased photosynthesis in crops. If this is the question, um, it, I have to re reply that these kinetics that present Posidonia species cannot increase the, the Rubisco kinetics of serving crop plants because they are very inefficient at the carboxylation site. Uh, if you, for example, you can see in this image, I don't know if you can uh, you can see my, my slides. Yeah, we can. Uh, there is a Posidonia species presented a low Rubisco carboxylation efficiency. The other points are uh, other terrestrial plants from C4 and on C3 plants, and you can observe that that these plants have a higher Rubisco carboxylation efficiency. So the Rubisco kinetics of Posidonia seems not to uh, be suitable to increase photosynthesis in crops, especially because this Rubisco has never op been optimized to to increase photosynthesis uh, in this species. Okay. Uh I've got a question from Bernard Genti. Uh, what, it, what is the evidence for the high oxygen concentration in tissue? I think you referred to um, Well, our evidence is from measurements that we made uh, from, for example, this, uh, this um, ana left anatomical image. You can see that the, a, rel a big thick cell wall in seagrasses. Uh, in literature, there is a there is a link between the, um, the the restriction in mesophyll diffusion of gases and the big thick cell wall. So, according to the models of uh, diffu of diffusion of gases in sea in seawater, and applying the restrictions that made this big uh, thick cell wall. Um, we can we can um, modulate or we can infer the oxygen concentration inside the inside the the, the Posidonia cells, and also this the result was published in other in 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 old uh, papers that reported this concentration. But this, it it is an estimation. We we are looking to measure it in in Posidonia species, but the methodology is challenging. And this is our next step in the future. <laughs> okay, so I think it, I think you answered this this question. That's just a follow-on question: Is you show photosynthetic rate dependencies on CO2 concentration? Did you measure CO2 rate or O2 rates? 
Well, in, in the case of Rubisco oxidation, we measured uh, CO2 fixation rates. But in the case of in vivo CO2, the in vivo measurements, we measure the oxygen production. So we have to assume a ratio that one oxygen, one molecule of oxygen produ produced is one molecule of CO2 feeds. It, this is an approximation in order to relate. I think the question is relating these graphs. So in this case, when when we when we measured in vivo a simulation, we measured uh, the oxygen um, the oxygen liberation. We we assume that the one molecule of oxygen uh, liberated is correspond corresponding to one molecule of CO2 fixed. So we have this assumption in this this assumption in these in these graphs. Yes. Okay. Well, I think that is all your questions at the moment. If there's any other questions, maybe we could, um, if we've got time, we can come back to them at the end of the webinar. So Perfect. thank you very much. That was really nice. I enjoyed that. Um, I'm now going to move us on to our second speaker, René Klein Langhorst. René is a senior scientist and program developer of Wageningen Plant Research. He started there in 1993, uh, working on isolation of disease resistance genes in plants. He then was general manager of Grinomics in 98, which is a high throughput DNA sequencing facility and was involved in the first uh, plant sequencing, which would be Arabidopsis. He went on to coordinate the EU Sol project, which was looking at food quality and safety in the Sol and AC, um, and was part of the European part of this international initiative to sequence the tomato genome. He was chairman of the international AC initiative, Sol, he was managing director of the Bio Solar Cells Programme, which is a Dutch national programme developing strategies to improve photosynthesis in plants, uh, microorganisms and artificial systems, and was one of the driving forces behind the Photosynthesis 2 initiative, which was a research proposal to the EC for a large program to improve uh, photosynthesis for increasing crop yields. Today, he's talking to us as coordinator of the Crop Booster P project, and, um, about the roadmap they've drafted for developing future-proof crops. So welcome, René. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you confirm that you see my presentation? Yes, it's looking good. Okay, good. Well, then to start uh, quoting Monty Python, now for something completely different, I want to take you along an, um, a journey that started about um, uh, eight years ago uh, so this is about uh, the Crop Booster P project. Uh, the project has uh, finished by now, but I was the coordinator of this um, uh, project. And um, basically, I want to tell you a story. Uh, it's a big adventure that started eight years ago and that might even take another 15 to 20 years to really complete. Um, to set the scene, uh, this is a quote also from the European Commission describing the current crisis that are facing the world. So uh, we have, of course, uh, we have a climate crisis, we have the biodiversity crisis, we have a crisis in food systems. And the worrying thing is that these crises are amplifying each other. So the climate crisis is really um, making the biodiversity crisis, food crisis worse. So uh, Brussels, uh, the European Commission once uh, coined the term here, this is the perfect storm. And I think they're quite right in this description. So the, the, the challenge is really short with all these uh, different crises. The, the climate crisis uh, has, of course, the, the challenge, how can we adapt to climate change? I think it's uh, too late to reverse it. So nothing is um, left but adapting to climate change. We have the biodiversity crisis uh, with, of course, the main question, how can we protect Earth vulnerable ecosystems? And we have the food crisis with, of course, the main question, how can we feed uh, in let's say the year 2050, about 10 billion people on this planet. Um, in 2015, so eight years ago, um, we started this adventure with um, a lot of uh, colleagues from Wageningen uh, thinking about uh, solutions uh, for basically the food crisis. And we approached the European Commission to discuss a proposal for a large scale European research program to increase global crop yields. 
And this proposal is really based on the deep concern in Wageningen that the world will not be able to feed itself uh, in uh, 2050. So this mentioned 10 billion people. And this proposal centered on increasing plant photosynthesis to increase crop yield. Um, the Commission uh, asked us to form a uh, consortium to um, uh, work this out and to draft a first kind of work program for such a program. And uh, this was the famous Photosynthesis 2.0 initiative with the subtitle uh, to develop the future crop varieties to double global artificial production. So you can really see we were quite ambitious um, uh, at that moment with this title. Um, this Photosynthesis 2 program was uh, received rather positive by um, uh, the Commission, but uh, DG Research, they proposed by then to broaden our scope and uh, more or less not talk about photosynthesis, but about crop yield, which of course is uh, the main driver that they're interested in. And I think they're quite right. And more in particular, uh, what they want is uh, to have solutions to stabilize crop yield in the face of climate change, to increase crop resource use efficiency to protect biodiversity and to increase uh, crop yields per acre to aid food security, but also for protection of biodiversity. And uh, the Commission uh, helped us by uh, launching a call in the Horizon 2020 program uh, for so-called uh, coordination and support action with the title of Future Proofing Our Plans. We responded to this call, which led to the fact that this initial plant uh, the photosynthesis 2.0 program yielded this crop booster p project and crop booster p as said is a response to this call future proofing our plans and what we did or wanted to do in the project is to uh, draft a roadmap and a research agenda how we could indeed um, uh, fulfill these requirements that the commission had on plant yield but it also happened uh, about two years later because the Commission also decided to make already some funding available to start the research program in Photosynthesis 2.0. And that became the Capitalized Project, which is our host today, and which is coordinated by my colleague from Wageningen, uh, Jeremy Harbinson. Okay, um, the Crop Booster project itself uh, said that uh, the project is over now. And the project did focus on crop improvement. So basically you can say it's about um, uh, advanced plant breeding. So it's not about farming systems. Uh, it's not about soil research. It's really about the plant. What we did, we drafted for the European Commission a roadmap to future-proof our crops. And future-proofing in our project definition means uh, make plants climate-proof. I uh, think in uh, terms like heat resistance, uh, drought resistance, salinity resistance, uh, resistance against water locking, etc. Uh, sustainable, in our de definition, think about uh, efficient use of water, efficient use of nitrogen and phosphorus and other kinds of input materials. High yielding, well, high yielding, of course, is high yielding. And high quality and definition in our project is we look at um, uh, nutritional quality. So this is not about um, improvement of taste or the kind of thing, but about the nutritional quality of the food crops. Um, with the idea that if we would adapt plants to become better resistant to climate, to be more sustainable or high yielding, uh, this should not go at the expense of the quality. So for sure we should be able and uh, keep in mind that the quality of the plants should not um, drop and even uh, preferably increase in uh, food quality. Um, to execute such a plan, um, we realize it's essential that um, uh, we get support from society. And therefore the roadmap that we have designed was done together with professional stakeholders from uh, the food uh, chain, but also uh, involving the men in the street, the public, uh, consumers, um, uh, to give their opinion about such a uh, potential crop yield program. And the name Crop Booster P comes from the fact that this P means preparatory. Because we think that this project will prepare for this large research program that we call for the moment the Crop Booster Program, in which we think we should execute this research agenda that we have developed. 
Let me show the structure of this Cop Booster P project. And we had uh, five main work packages. The first one, work package one, was making kind of uh, inventorization of the state of the art of plant sciences. Where do we stand at this moment? Uh, what are the tools, the techniques, the genes that we have available to improve our crop varieties? Work package two was focusing on the input of professional stakeholders. Uh, asking uh, farmers, uh, people from industry, um, uh, consumer organizations, their preferences, wishes, and expectations about applying this kind of technology for plant and research. Uh, work package three was engaging society. So this was more getting a uh, take and an insight in the feelings of society when such a large crop uh, program would be executed. Work package four was about bringing together the scientific community in Europe and also drafting together a uh, research agenda for uh, the roadmap. And basically, work package five um, uh, ties it all together and develop finally uh, the complete roadmap. Now, to give you a little bit more details about these uh, work packages, so I said work package one was about the scientific and technological inventory. What we did, we built a database that we filled with that what we thought the 800 most important uh, publications about the state of the art of plant breeding and research for abiotic stress resistance, resource use efficiency, yield increase, and nutritional quality. So this gets you a really nice backbone of, let's say, the current state of the art, what is possible. But also what we did, we carried out so-called scenario planning. Um, and this is uh, quite new because people talk about the future, but okay, what is the future? And you can, of course, imagine different futures in which different things will happen. And in our program, we designed four different scenarios, uh, each um, uh, painting a different kind of future. And in each of these different futures, different kind of technologies would more or less be applicable or not. Um, but we developed, as for instance, a scenario called plantovation. In this scenario, um, the science is in a driver's seat and can more or less design anything that they would like. In scenario two, consumers are thought to be in the driver's seat of um, development, so the, the consumers would more or less determine what plant breeders would do. Scenario three is kind of uh, an emergency scenario in which we would run out of food and that um, uh, the governments would take over more or less decisions on food production and decide what to grow and what to produce. And scenario four is a kind of a negative scenario called reject tech. Uh, here society more or less is in the driver's seat. And in this case, uh, it's a scenario that society more or less is against every use of technology at all. So it's a kind of negative scenario. But if you would ask me at the moment, where are we? Because we did it about uh, four years ago. Well, if you look at the things like the Ukraine crisis, look at the COVID crisis, it uh, sounds a little bit like we're heading for this kind of food emergency scenario, but also if you look at society and the negative um, feelings in society against all kinds of technologies, it could also be a little bit like this reject tech scenario. But of course, uh, only time will show where exactly we will have to. Okay, this uh, second uh, work package, uh, input of professionals on proposed technological options. We organized a lot of workshops and uh, surveys were conducted on the farmers, agro-industry, consumer organizations. We did this for three European regions, so the northern part, the central part, and the southern part of Europe. And we presented different options for yield increase, abiotic stress resistance, sustainability, and quality uh, options. And we asked participants to prioritize. What do you think is most important for your particular business or your interests? And really in short, uh, if you look at farmers and consumers, they value sustainability and abiotic stress resistance highest, while the agro industry uh, top prioritized yield increase. And of course, these are not so strange because this really shows that farmers already are feeling the effects of climate change. So farmers are really concerned about heat and uh, drought and um, uh, water shortages. So they saw, well, this is important to solve. Uh, consumers, of course, are concerned uh, with the environment. So that's also logical. And of course, agro industry, uh, at the end of the day, it's still industry and yield is still the main driver industry. So the industry was still heavily heavily involved in yield increase as a priority. 
And the overall advice that we got from them is, uh, well, it's not only for auto plants, it's the entire food production chain that needs to be future proofed. And that's of course really logical. And also they warned uh, about negative trade-offs. Then this third work package number three was about the interaction with society. So what are the, the, the needs and expectations in society if you talk about food production, plant breeding, sustainability, etc. So also there we organized a lot of workshops and focus groups with participants from all across Europe. And uh, we had some uh, major outcomes there. Also there they say that um, uh, it should not only be about um, uh, plants and plant improvement, it should also include uh, several other important um, uh, parts of the food chain. For instance, uh, digitization to manage agricultural production systems, so the more the digital backbone of agriculture should be reinforced. Uh, we should also take an uh, improvement of soil quality, uh, look at reduction of uh, food loss and food waste. And especially for innovative plant breeding techniques, uh, regulation and communication are deemed critical. This is, of course, quite interesting. Um, we really got the advice to be open and transparent about the risks and benefits of the production chain and society. And also to involve society um, uh, to avoid things like that happened with the GMO technology um, um, uh, debate that really backlashed. Uh, to go into this a little bit deeper, what we did, we organized uh, so-called citizen juries. That's uh, quite interesting. We asked European citizens to give their opinion about proposed solutions and approaches about technology. Um, to do this, we have uh, launched these citizen juries in the Netherlands and in the UK. And uh, in these juries, we discuss the use and acceptance of new breeding technologies like uh, CRISPR-Cas in agriculture. Uh, how it worked in practice is that uh, we had uh, kind of online um, um, uh, seminars for about one week in which we had these juries from these two countries were selected randomly by kind of external office to represent more or less a kind of um, uh, average um, uh, representation of the British and Dutch um, uh, population. There were about 10 to 15 people in each jury. And after one week of uh, listening to all kinds of um, uh, talks, uh, about the topic, but also against these, these kind of technologies, the jury was asked to make a verdict. And uh, what was quite uh, nice to see is that both the jury in the Netherlands as in UK, they um, agreed with the use of new breeding technologies in agriculture, but under certain um, uh, conditions, uh, very logical ones, these crops must be safe and healthy, uh, technology should serve societal purpose like combating hunger and climate change. Crops must be freely accessible and at a fair price, both for farmers and consumers. Well, I think this is all um, uh, very promising because it shows that if you give um, uh, citizens and society uh, a say in this, after we have given this a kind of, um, uh, well, I hope, a way of presenting details about technology without pushing it, but only giving the um, uh, more or less explanation of what it is and why you should use it, then society really is able to make decisions that these things can be used under the proper conditions. Okay, well, package four was about European um, uh, research agenda. What we did first, we made a network, we mapped all the European um, parties that are involved in uh, plant breeding research. We did this by analyzing over 14,000 publications and we looked for co-publications. And this gives you this kind of networks. You don't have to read the details, but you see all these colored um, um, uh, spheres. This is, for instance, INRA in France, uh, Wageningen here is in green, CNRS is somewhere there, the Max Planck Institute is there, and you can see who is um, uh, working together with whom in this field. After we met this uh, European landscape, uh, we assembled 16 so-called focus groups uh, involving 130 experts from these uh, from 70 universities and arrived from 15 uh, countries in this network. And these focus groups they formulated the research needs and objectives for 16 subtopics under the topics yield, nutritional quality, and sustainability. So, as example, if you look at yield, 
in the yield, we had um, uh, focus groups on photosynthesis, but also on soil sink relationships, uh, shoot architecture, uh, root architecture. Uh, likewise, in the nutritional quality, we had uh, focus groups working on protein content, uh, vitamins and antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, anti-nutritional um, uh, compounds, uh, biomass digestibility, and sustainability, we had working groups, focus groups on, for instance, nitrogen use efficiency, phosphorus, and water use efficiency. Then, work package five, they brought it all together. First, we looked at all the results that we had from the other four work packages, and if needed, we um, uh, had some additional experts with, to fill any remaining gaps in our plans and program. And all the results of Corpus to P were then uh, compiled into what we call the white paper, or alias the roadmap. And this roadmap knows two main sections. It's the strategic research agenda and the implementation plan. So as you can see here on the left, the strategic research agenda is about, okay, what crops will we work on, what traits, how we will do it, and also about social research to be sure that we still keep in contact with society during the entire um, program. The rest of the implementation plan is more about, okay, if you have such a large program, and it is really large because what we have in mind more or less is a program that should last for about 15 years of 100 partners and maybe a budget and uh, approaching uh, 1 billion euro. So you need also to think about how will you manage such a large consortium? Uh, what is your planning? How will you deal, for instance, with um, uh, responsible research and innovation, stakeholder interactions? How will you communicate with lay audiences, et cetera, et cetera? So this is also part of the roadmap. Well, then in October 17 last year, we officially presented the roadmap to the European Commission. Uh, we handed over in the presentation uh, two documents. One is the executive summary, shown here on the left. Another document that we handed over is a so-called policy brief that tells the European Commission how our plans realign with their political ambitions and policies. And he is, he is all standing there um, outside the European Commission um, uh, after the presentation of this um, uh, the roadmap. So what will now be the next steps? The next step will be from this Crop Booster P project to what we call the Crop Booster program. All our members in our consortium have expressed their support and ambition to execute the roadmap in a large pan-European research program, this Crop Booster program. Uh, as a scientific basis and platform, we established a new EFSO working group called Future Proof Crops. Uh, I told you the Corpus DP project is over, and one way to keep our consortium together is via this EFSO working group. This uh, EFSO working group forms a platform for European plant scientists working in the field of future proofing crops. There's a special focus on abiotic stress resistance, sustainability, and photosynthesis. And it's there to interact with the European Commission also and other EU bodies on matters pertaining to future proofing of crops. So we really think that uh, this future um, uh, proof crops workshop uh, working group will be really our basis for the years to come to further develop and work on this um, crop booster program. Back in 2015, this is years ago, uh, we were also advised by the Commission to design a program what they say could qualify as an FET flagship. Well, an FET flagship was a really very big instrument from Brussels that does not exist anymore. But in those days, these flagships were large programs, as I said, 10, 15 year runtime, more than 100 labs involved, budgets of about 1 billion euro. That's more or less the thing that we had in mind and still have in mind. So they don't exist anymore. And we are now talking with the European Commission, uh, okay, what options are there at this moment? to fund this large crop booster program. And one of the possibilities, I won't say this will really happen for sure, but it could be that we start a new European partnership. A European partnership is also a large research program and there's a very good reason now to go for a partnership because if you look at this slide, this is the landscape of the current large scale EU research programs for sustainable food systems. You see a lot is covered there. You see we have a mission for soil and health, which is about soil research. We have a partnership called agroecology, 
which is about um, uh, optimizing farming systems. Then we have a partnership on animals, looking at animals, and we have a partnership on uh, food, which is about food production and food content, and non-food, bio-based. And partnerships underlying this, this is about biodiversity and uh, agriculture of data. So for the animals, you have this entire chain from soil farming system, animals to food and non-food. But for plants, there really is a gap at the moment. And we are proposing a commission to fill this gap with a partnership called Future Proof Crops. And in this partnership, we will do the research on plants. That's also for plants. We have the entire um, uh, chain from soil, farming systems, plants, non-food and food applications. So this is our proposal to the European Commission at the moment. We already have a potential core consortium of over 85 research institutions. Uh, this is just a representation of uh, this consortium. Uh, it uh, is built up of uh, the people who joined us with this photosynthesis to consumer program. People from Crop Booster are here. People from um, uh, uh, the other kind of uh, projects have been involved uh, here. And this is uh, still growing and growing. Well, this is more or less uh, the end of uh, what I want to show you. But in fact, this is not the end, but it has to be continued. As I said, this hopefully will take another 15, 20 years if we can really execute the program. So I have included some links at the end of my presentation that you can follow. Uh, for instance, the link to the roadmap itself. Here you can find all the scientific details of what we propose to the Commission. Also, this executive summary, you have a link or the policy brief. Our website is here given as a link. If you have interest in joining this EPSO working group, which I really think you should all do, here's the link to the EPSO working group. And finally, we will publish um, uh, very soon and, uh, in a special issue of Food and Energy Security, uh, 11 uh, Cobooster manuscripts describing more or less um, everything that we did uh, within the project. And with this, I thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Very nice. So if you have any questions for Rene, please put them in the chat box. I'll kick off with one. Um, what do you see are the biggest barriers to a joined up crop breed, future proof crops? Um, the biggest barrier at the moment is, um, A, of course, funding, uh, and B, the political um, will and ambition to really do this. What is so complicated about plants is that research takes so long. We all know about plants, but uh, our estimation is if you really want to breed new varieties the way we propose, you need at least 10, 15 years to do it. But if you talk to the commission people, they are used to have a horizon of about four or five years. So they're happy to talk with you about research for the next four years, but for the next 30 years, they say, well, somebody else should by then solve the problem, we think. So th that's one of the hard parts. Yeah, 10 to 15 years is a long time, isn't it? And you sort of wonder how fast climate change is happening, but is it going to be even different to what you're aiming for uh, in that 10 years to some extent? Yeah, yeah, do yeah. You, do, you, do you know how much the Horizon Europe programme um, is going to be targeting abiotic stress? Uh, a lot. So we are also trying now to um, uh, include more of this topic also in Horizon Europe in the second phase of the program. And we, at the moment we are proposing that they will have additional emphasis also on abiotic stress and crop improvement in the, the Horizon Europe program. So already things are being done there, but we need more. And what's more important, you need to integrate it. I mean, what you want is kind of a complete redrawn of your crop plan. So should work both to end quality and yield, uh, resilience. And so the group should all work together on that single aim. So if you only would work on ABL stress resistance, it's not enough. You should do it all. And that's I do you think when you see those those lists of, um, as a breeder, are you interested in breeding for this, 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 and it's quality and it's quantity and it's resilience? Of course, you're going to say yes to all of uh, yeah, but uh, nobody's doing well, it. In, in reality, is that what you're going to guess? In reality, there's surely always going to be um, a shortfall of one of those one of those traits. Do you think? Yeah, well, let's say we have to solve probably a lot of practical um, um, uh, problems uh, once we're doing this. 
Um, the trouble is what we are proposing is so complicated that uh, nobody has any experience with it. What will happen if you try to improve a cropland both for yield, but also equip it with uh, genes for ableton stress resistance, make them research your efficiency and take care that the quality stays okay? It's, mm. it's really, it's, it's kind of a big, big challenge. And this is yeah. also the reason we really pledge for this coherent program and not uh, let it uh, to the commission decide to spread it over 1,000 projects because you need really to have an integrated view and vision to do this. And, and the, your program is is um, highlighting abiotic stress, but do you think that a future program would be targeting biotic stresses, or is there something out there already that is doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. excellent question. I get we get the question a lot. Um, there are more or less two things. First of all. Uh, there's already a lot of work going on in the Commission on biotic stress. So, and there are many projects and we're looking at all kinds of plant diseases and plant and, and uh, pathogens. And of course, we want to incorporate also that. Um, in the beginning, we also had quite a mundane reason. We didn't have enough budget to tackle it all. So we decided, okay, let's leave the biotic stress part to the already the large programs already running. And we will just look at the, the abiotic stress part and the yield components, because that needed to be beefed up. But at the end of the day, you have to bring it all together. So for sure, this program will also incorporate and work together with people working on biotic stress. Um, but there's also something else to take into account because we can also quite well predict what is abiotic stress. You can predict what will be the stresses from climate change, like heat, drought, uh, salinity. But what exactly, what kind of new um, diseases will emerge in five to 10 years from now is kind of hard not to crack. Mm -hmm. So how would you uh, start preparing for diseases which you don't know yet? So that's a little bit complicated. And I really am, am uh, looking forward to how people will solve that and that we can integrate those approaches also. Okay. Uh, I have a question from uh, Zini Johnson. You spoke about societal ideas about gene editing. Do you think GMOs are around the corner for Europe or are we still a long way off? Um, GMOs in the old um, definition are off, off the table. I'm quite convinced about this. The really best thing that could happen is that we get more or less freedom to operate with these new technologies like uh, gene editing, CRISPR-Cas technology. But at the moment, they also are labeled GMOs, but I hope that will change with new EU leg legislation. Uh, I know the EU is moving at this moment, and there will be probably this spring a new kind of a directive about how to work with uh, things like CRISPR-Cas. So I'm quite, well, let's say, quite optimistic that we get something, some more leverage there, some more, more room to operate. Um, but I also tell people from the commission that we want is so complicated that we really need each and every tool in the toolbox to do this. And CRISPR-Cas would enormously help us forward. Jonathan Mannery asks, what would you say to people in the industry who see biotic stresses as their main issue? How can we promote the importance of breeding for abiotic stress? Uh, well, to give a uh, kind of um, uh, blunt answer, this will happen by itself. I mean, climate change is coming there. The urgency for abiotic stress resistance is becoming more evident each and every day. And like our survey among farmers, they already said, OK, this is the most important thing. So I'm not so uh, busy with uh, thinking how should we promote climate change. Uh, the sad thing is it will be promoting mm -hmm. it. What, I've got a question. Well, what, to what extent do you think society, when you do those um, consumer, society, uh, consumer surveys, to what extent do you think you should be taking their views fully into account I, I'm, I'm thinking i'm thinking brexit i've got brexit in mind you're asking consumers what is important to them i don't think many consumers are going to say i'm you know yield and sustainability they're they're concerned that it's going to be on their shelves more than anything yeah. i do you think they are the right people really to be answering questions on those well it depends how you do it i mean i know that european commission is really in favor of kind of co-design that you even involve um, uh, normal citizens in the design of research programs. And I don't believe in that. I mean, uh, they don't have the expertise to do that, let me honestly. On the other hand, it would be killing if you would design a big program. At the end of the day, society says, we don't want this. We don't, don't want the results that you produce there. So you have to be really sure that you take them along, tell them what you're doing, explain why you're doing it, and mm. as good as possible, take their concerns into consideration. 
yeah that's a fair point mm. is there any other any any more questions for Renee? that just leaves me to to thank you very much for a really interesting talk and thank both our speakers today and of course to the audience for joining us um next month we have uh, two new speakers. We have, can we have the next slide, please, Christina? We have Tom Thierwin and Mark Hewerman uh, speaking. So please don't forget to register for the April webinar. Um, and yes, thanks again for attending. We will be here again next month. Thank you to the speakers. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye, thank you.